Are the Olympics a monumental waste of money? Or do they bring both short-term and long-term economic benefits that help to offset the costs that are involved? That's what I'm going to look at in this video, particularly against the backdrop that has been the slow-moving train wreck that is the Tokyo Olympics and the recent announcement that Brisbane will be hosting the 2032 Olympics. I'm going to look at the costs that have been involved in holding these Olympic events and whether they have been justified. And, spoiler alert, the Olympics don't make money. Which possibly comes as a surprise to no one, but I'll go through some of what people are saying about this. Now, if you have any thoughts about the Olympics and about whether it's even worth hosting them anyway, let me know that in the comments below. And of course, it'd be great if you like the video and subscribe to the channel. All right, so let's have a look at some background here. The basic background and the impetus for this video is really twofold. One, Tokyo has been a complete train wreck. Viewership is way down. It's been expensive. Uh, I'll go over the figures for this in just a second, but Tokyo has been really not a good example uh, for the Olympics, that is, in that it is basically not going to make money. Brisbane recently had the Olympics awarded to it. To announce that the Games of the 35th Olympiad are awarded to Brisbane, Australia. <laughs> Obviously, very, very exciting right here. So Brisbane was awarded the Olympics. Now, given that I am Australian, I did not particularly receive this rather well, given that I would rather our government doesn't just throw money away on random crap. And that's effectively what the Olympics could end up entailing. OK, so now let's look at some of the costs involved in the Tokyo Olympics. To get at the Tokyo Olympics costs, I'm going to refer to this article in the Wall Street Journal. And basically the headline kind of says it all. It says, the Tokyo Olympics staggering price tag and where it stands in history. And then we continue down here and it says, the Tokyo Olympics are said to be the most expensive Olympics on record. According to officials, the budget is 15.4 billion. But Japanese government auditors have said total spending tops 20 billion, almost three times the original forecast of 7.4 billion when Tokyo put together its bid for the Olympics. That puts the Games 11.04 billion over the total cost of London's Olympics, the next most expensive ever. Then it continues on, the Olympic Games are one of the most expensive mega events any country can organize, according to a study on Olympics costs. The average sports-related cost of hosting the Olympics is 12 billion, with non-sports-related expenses generally several times that, the study found. In the case of the Tokyo Olympics, Postponing the event added $2.8 billion to its final cost, according to the organizing committee. Then if we continue onwards here, it says the single biggest cost of the Olympics has been the construction of venues. Eight venues were built specifically for the Games at a cost of around $3 billion. That includes 68,000-seat national stadium completed in 2019 and two 15,000-seat arenas for swimming and volleyball. An additional 25 venues were renovated. So, so far, we're already seeing that the Tokyo Olympics is costing a lot of money. The question, of course, is, are the costs justified? Do the costs result in long-term benefits? To see this, we're going to need to dig deeper into the historical costs of the Olympics, and we're going to need to dissect whether or not they've generated enough returns for them to really be justifiable. So to dig deeper, into the cost of the Olympics. I'm going to start off with this graph, again, rather helpfully provided by the Wall Street Journal, which is basically looking at the costs of Olympics over time in billions of dollars, continuing from 1960 onwards. Now, what we can immediately see is Tokyo is the most expensive here. Now, it's going to be really worthwhile focusing on the more recent ones, because the further back we go, the less representative they truly are. Because of changes in technology, changes in demands, et cetera, et cetera. So if we go from 2000 onwards, what we can immediately see is we've got this cluster here. They're all clustering around that low, well, low single or high single digits, just under 10 billion-ish area is basically where we're clustering here. Then it continues upwards and spikes sharply to London. Then it spikes sharply to Sochi, which admittedly is winter. And then again, spikes sharply to Tokyo. So Sochi obviously required a lot of expenditure because of where it was located. A lot of uh, development in capital expenditure was required. Tokyo, however, 
requires less of that, given that it's in a metropolitan area and not kind of the middle of nowhere, in a location where they wanted to put ski fields, they shouldn't have really had ski fields. So in any case, we're seeing significant costs accrue. Again, to dig deep into this, we can look at the cost overrun. And it appears to be relatively common for the Olympics to cost significantly more than originally planned. So pretty much everything has run over budget, whether it's winter or summer. So in reality, Montreal in 1976 had the largest cost overrun in percentage terms, but Tokyo is still pretty hefty. Rio has also been pretty terrible as well. Uh, so what we're seeing here is significant cost overruns, which means that even when you budget in X dollars, you oftentimes end up spending 2X in any case. So those cost overruns are also something we need to bear in mind. The cost overruns can arise for myriad reasons. I'd say the most likely of these is that the government systematically fails to estimate accurately how much these events are going to cost. That's a huge problem because clearly the government's job is to do this. To some extent, there might be some opportunistic price gouging from constructors or builders trying to build these events, but I'd say that is very unlikely. The reason I'd say it's very unlikely is basically there's supply and demand, and that's how the market works. As soon as there's a significant uptick in demand for construction, it's going to increase the price of getting that construction done. So you can't blame builders for charging more money when they now are in high demand. Again, I want to reiterate here, builders are not to blame for charging more money when there is high demand for their services. The government is at fault for putting in an event into an economy where there might already have been supply, supply constraints. Nevertheless, we're seeing significant cost overruns here. So when we're seeing these significant costs, it naturally begs the question of, are these costs even worth it? For example, if you spend $6 billion, but you get $10 billion back, that's okay because you've made a profit of $4 billion. But if you spend $6 billion and you only get $5 billion back, then clearly it is a waste of time and you shouldn't have bothered. So we need to analyze whether or not these are worthwhile. Now, what I'm going to do firstly is I'm going to very briefly address a study that argues that they are not beneficial. I'm not going to go through the full extent of this study because it is rather long and it was published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. However, it does give us a bit of an idea and I'll just talk about the summary for it, the main conclusions. So here is our study uh, by Bard and Matteson, uh, and it's called Going for Gold, the Economics of the Olympics, again in Journal of Economic Perspectives. So I'll go for the first and the last paragraph of the intro, and I'll leave it to you to check out the whole thing if that's what you're interested in doing. So what they're saying to begin with is, in summer 2016, the eyes of the world will turn to Rio de Janeiro as it hosts the games of the 31st Olympiad, better known as the Summer Olympics. So clearly this is a little out of date. Unfortunately, the price tag of well over $10 billion for the event is adding to the already considerable strain on the government budgets in Brazil. Faced with a nasty recession, cuts in public services and rising unemployment, throngs of Brazilians have turned out to protest what is seen as a wasteful expenditure and a misallocation of resources to the Olympics. Throw in the growing threat of the Zika virus, and Brazil may end up with larger crowds of agitators protesting the government than of sports fans cheering on the athletes. But are these complaints about the Olympic spending justified? The quadrennial Summer Olympic Games is one of the world's premier sporting events, with over 10,000 athletes representing 204 countries, 300 individual events in 28 different sports, over 10 million tickets sold to spectators and a worldwide television audience in the billions. On a somewhat smaller scale, the most recent Winter Olympics held in 2014 in Sochi, Russia, welcomed nearly 3,000 athletes from 88 countries to compete in 98 events in 15 disciplines, were generating large revenues and massive television ratings. So that's a rather nice intro, but it gets worse from here. So in the concluding paragraph of the introduction, they note their effective findings. It says here, each of these costs and benefits will be addressed in turn. But the, but the overwhelming conclusion is that in most cases, the Olympics are a money losing proposition for host cities. They result in positive net benefits only under very specific and unusual circumstances. Furthermore, the cost benefit proposition is worse for cities in developing countries than for those in the industrialized world. In closing, we discuss why what looks like 
an increasingly poor investment decision on the part of cities still receive significant bidding interest. And where the changes in the bidding process of the International Olympic Committee will improve outcomes for potential hosts. So this study effectively has gone through all of the Olympics up to Rio de Janeiro and has basically looked at whether they make money and found that they didn't. And the only way they can make money is on a very outlying type circumstances. And the reason for this is we have these significant costs. The costs come in the form of infrastructure construction, uh, logistics, general staffing, the construction of actual premises. Those are the types of costs, oftentimes in the vicinity of like $10 billion plus dollars. The benefits can be short and long term. The short term benefits involve things like tourism, ticket sales, uh, initial expenditure on restaurants and the like. The long term benefits theoretically involve having venues for people to use in the future, maybe some future FDI, foreign direct investment, maybe some future tourism from advertising. Now you've got those supposed long term benefits and the short term benefits. The thing this study finds is those benefits simply don't outweigh the costs. And this is likely to be even more the case with Tokyo. So again, going back to a WSG article, the 2021 Olympics are turning into a billion dollar bust, a $20 billion bust for Japan. Host nation expected an economic windfall and global recognition. But amid pandemic, a disgruntled populace just wants it to go away. Then it continues on down here, uh, and it says, Tokyo, when to Toyota Motor Corp said this week it wouldn't run any ads in Japan tied to the Olympics, it sent a message louder than any TV commercial about the host nation's grim mood. Toyota is Japan's most valuable company and a global Olympic sponsor, the top rank shared by only 13 others worldwide. For US audiences, it spent millions of dollars on a Super Bowl commercial featuring the Olympic rings. But in Japan, any link to the games was too sensitive for the automaker to advertise. The Olympics open on Friday, a year late and during the COVID-19 state of emergency in Tokyo. Anticipation and expectations for an economic windfall have largely evaporated. Stadiums and arenas that cost over $7 billion to build or renovate for the games will mostly be empty after spectators were banned. Japan wanted the Tokyo Olympics to show the country is still a global force despite its declining population and maturing economy eclipsed by China. The games would also show how Japan rebounded from a devastating tsunami in 2011. Instead, the Olympics has compounded a malaise over the pandemic that has put its leader under pressure to keep his job. We can also see how this manifests in TV ratings, where it says, Tokyo Olympics opening draws 16.7 million US TV viewers, a 33-year low. NBC's broadcast of the Tokyo Olympic Games opening ceremony drew 16.7 viewers, the smallest US television audience for the event in the past 33 years, according to preliminary data from Compost owned NBC Universal on Saturday. Across all platforms, including NBCOlympics.com and the NBC Sports app, 17 million people watched the ceremony, NBC Universal said in an email. The streaming audience on these platforms grew 76% from the 2018 Pyeongchang opening ceremony and 72% from the 2016 Rio opener. Friday's audience reflects a steep drop despite difficult comparisons with previous opening ceremonies when viewers had fewer streaming options. Okay, so adding all of this together, what we're seeing is the Olympics in general terms don't make money. The Tokyo Olympics especially isn't making money for a couple of reasons. A, no tourism. B, no ticket sales. C, low viewership. Basically, things aren't making money for the Olympics here. So we're seeing in general terms, Olympics aren't making money. Tokyo especially won't make money. So in general terms, they appear to be just a gigantic waste of money that people should not really be pursuing. I personally don't get why Australia would even bother bidding for these. Because if they're not making money, what on earth is the point? Like, why? I don't get it. Now, this then begs the question of, will the Brisbane Olympics be any different? Well, to be honest, I don't have very much faith in them being any different. For a few reasons. Firstly, there's no good reason to think Brisbane is going to be any more profitable than any other location for the Olympics. They haven't put forward a case as to why this is going to be profitable. In none of the media statements did Brisbane say, well, the Olympics haven't made money in the past, but we're going to do so this way. Nothing along those lines. Secondly, it's a, la it's a Labour government. They are not known for keeping to a budget. I mean, let's face it, they're not known for being spendthrift. So I suspect that they as a government 
are even less likely to keep things under control than another government. Now, granted, it is 2032 when the Olympics will be. The government could easily change over then. Spending priorities could easily change. I dare say people aren't really going to be that interested in spending a lot of money on the Olympics when we're still recovering from the significant expenditure that has been required in 2020 and 2021. Nevertheless, maybe the mood will change by then. But overall, we're seeing the Olympics simply don't make money. They appear to be a monumental waste of money, and it's not entirely clear why one would want to host them. The question, of course, is why do people still keep bidding to run the Olympics? Some theories have been put forward. These include the idea of national pride, a misplaced belief that they will actually make money this time, a desire to try to effectively have pork barreling rolled up into something that has the veneer of legitimacy. Whatever the case might be, people still keep bidding for the Olympics, but one could argue that they probably shouldn't, and as a taxpayer, you probably won't want your government to do so. So those are my thoughts about the Olympics. If you have any thoughts about whether or not they're worth hosting, whether they make any money, or whether Brisbane or Tokyo are going to be any different, let me know that in the comments below, because it would be interesting to hear your thoughts as well. And otherwise, of course, it would be great if you like the video and subscribe to the channel. And I hope to see you for future videos as well. Bye.